A biblical perspective on life, culture and current events. This is 2020 on Vision. About to get into a conversation, let me just give a little warning here uh, for parents and just mindful that uh, in some parts of Australia, like WA, sometimes parents are just taking their kids on the way to school at this time. So uh, my warning here that our conversation over this next hour may be one that you should shield little ears from. It will be an adult conversation and uh, who knows where it will go and the sorts of things that we'll be talking about. We're going to turn our attention to the deterioration of the values in our council and school libraries. Our special guest today says last year the Australian Classification Board and the Classification Review Board both made shocking decisions to grant an unrestricted rating to the pedophile fantasy comic called Gender Queer. And it appears that this book can now legally be sold or loaned to children in Australia. Families advocate Bernard Gaynor says it may be the first time ever that the government censors have given the green light to pedophile imagery. So a conversation today about our public libraries and our school libraries. There's concern that libraries are no longer safe spaces, but places where children are being groomed. Well, families advocate Bernard Gaynor has been highlighting the dangers of many of the books appearing on library shelves under the guise of children's reading. You might recall Bernard, a decorated Australian Army veteran and host of the online Bernie Gaynor Show, uh, Bernie, a special welcome back to 2020. G'day, thanks for having me back, Neil. Bernie, let's get straight into the deep end here. Uh, this may be the first time ever the government censors have given the green light to pedophile imagery. That ought to be a shock to everyone listening. Yeah, it should be a shock. Uh, and it is a very serious thing that has happened, but it is true. So in the book Gender Queer, um, you know, and this is going to get into a bit, bit of detail here. So I hope if people have concerns about their children, they, sh- they should um, shield this. But this is a book that's in public libraries. There is a part of that book that shows a man touching the genitalia of a boy. Uh, and it is in the context of the author's best fantasy um, and her elaborate fantasy, as she describes it, um, in relation to her masturbation habits. That is what that book is about. And the Australian Classification Board gave the green light to that imagery and said that it can legally be given to children. It has a recommendation that it shouldn't be given to people under the age of 15, but that is merely a recommendation. Libraries around Australia can lend it to children. Schools can study this book. Uh, Isn't it amazing? And just to draw attention to this for a moment, uh, because here we are apologising for the sorts of imagery that might come up in our conversation uh, because we're talking to an adult audience and there may be some little ears uh, within uh, speaking range. Um, But this is the sort of thing that is on the bookshelves in our public libraries. You might have an idea just how extensive that is, but uh, children can be exposed to this without any warning. Uh, Yeah, so I found this book, uh, first of all, in Australia, in my local Council Library uh, in South East Queensland in Logan City Council, uh, which is where we are. Uh, it was in the children's section of the library. It was right near a whole bunch of books that young children would be interested in or 12 to 15-year-olds, Batman comics, for instance, uh, things like that. It was in there. Uh, and I have um, researched every library network in Australia now, public library network, and it is in many libraries across this country. Uh, so... Um, you know, if people want to find out more information about whether it's in their local library, along with some other very highly pornographic books, um, they can sign up to my website. And in my weekly update emails, I generally send out a a list of, of where these books are available. But it is in many libraries across Australia. I haven't found it in any schools yet, but it would not surprise me. Okay. I remember when you first made this discovery and you said, I'm not going to remain quiet about this. I need to speak up. Uh, I need some campaigns with my local council. And things have begun to snowball from there. And people have caught the idea that they need to do something in their own town, in their own community, in their own suburb. How have things grown since the initial time when we started talking about this? 
Yeah, so w when I found that book, Gender Queer, I had a bit of a look around the library and I found another of other very disturbing comic series. I'm talking graphic, pornographic comics that show in great explicit detail even things like rape and bestiality uh, in the public library. These books are available for children to borrow. Um, some of those books have since been classified as restricted publications, which means that they were illegal to even have on the shelves. Um, these are books that councils have been lending to kids for years. Um, and I have targeted four main authors. So that's the Genderqueer um, book by My Co-Babe. There are a number of series by Garth Ennis, an American-style comic, um, and a, also another person called Matt Fraction. So books such as The Boys um, or Sex Criminals is another comic. Um, that is widely available. Uh, and a, another Japanese author who literally campaigns for child pornography cartoons um, and draws child pornography cartoons. His books were in many, many libraries across Australia. Uh, so I started a campaign uh, probably uh, just over 12 months ago um, or 18 months ago now. Um, and I'm very happy to report that in 13 councils in Queensland, books have been removed. In 10 of those councils, every single book that I have targeted has been removed. So some councils are holding out on some books. I have no doubt that if we put enough pressure on, they will cave in. And this is the first time in Australia, I think, that we have been successful. There has been a successful campaign to remove books from public libraries. And I'm very proud of that. And I've been working with local people, um, mainly in Queensland, but in South Australia and Western Australia and, and Tasmania um, and others. Um, and I can tell you that libraries are starting to remove books now without me even having contacted them. They're starting to disappear, and that is a good thing. What about librarians here? Um, my uh, my kind thought towards librarians is that they are having the children at their best interest, and uh, they'll be resistant uh, to having these sorts of books appear in the library that they're in charge of. So not on my watch. Uh, you're not going to have this stuff in there. But is there, in some sense, like an infiltration? Are there activists at work uh, trying to get these sorts of books onto library shelves? Any thoughts here? Yes, I do have some thoughts, Neil. And I think that your approach is charitable but is naive. No. So the Australian Library Information Association, which is the peak librarian body in this country, is actively pushing for these books to be put on shelves. They are tracking me. They are tracking my campaigns. They are vigorously opposed to them. They are pushing back. They want these books on shelves. They promote them. Uh, and I am very upfront in telling parents that libraries are not safe spaces. Now, that does not mean that every librarian uh, is in favour of these books. That is definitely not the case. And I do talk to librarians who are very concerned about the situation. But overall, the official channels of, I guess, the library training and professional development networks in Australia are actively pushing to get these books on the shelves and they are very unhappy that they are being removed. And it's as though there's a campaign that's being run to change the thoughts of the way that librarians might be protective and uh, to open the floodgates for these sorts of books. So I think people need to understand a couple of things about library culture because there's a general impression that libraries are safe spaces for children. Okay, but if you look at my co-babe's book, Gender Queer, she's got a whole section in, in that book about how she works or worked in libraries and about the culture there. And it was a very pro-LGBT and permissive culture. So that was just a very little interesting insight into her life. She put out a, a, a comic last year, late last year, thanking librarians across America for protecting her book and for handing it out to children. And she's also written in an opinion piece where she says it's very important that her book is in public libraries because children can borrow it um, or even read it in the library without their parents knowing. So this is the people, I guess, on, one, on the other side of the debate are pushing libraries. Now, we also know there's something else that parents should be aware of, and that is that um, people who groom children, so pedophiles, quite often use pornographic material, sex education books, books like My Co-Babe's uh, Co book, Gender Queer, to introduce children to sexual themes, to desensitise them and groom them. They use these books to groom children. They are in libraries. So there are people who are interested in these books. They know that they can find them in public libraries and they know that children are there. It is a dangerous place uh, and I think we need to be more careful about what goes on inside libraries. 
Now, we're going to hear very shortly about an incident that's happening in Western Australia, in Albany, and very shortly I'll introduce you to another guest uh, into the program here. But you've got three campaigns underway in the state of Queensland, Bernie. Give us an insight here into what's going on in places like uh, Mackay and Rockhampton and Bundaberg. Sure. So in Mackay, um, they have removed uh, a number of audio books that are pornographic and e-books. Um, they are keeping or pushing to keep some books. So, uh, and look, the council up there is divided on this. I have spoken with some councillors like George Christensen. He's been fantastic. Other councillors, I must admit, I'm very surprised that I've been yelled at, called a bigot um, by councillors such as, um, uh, I've forgotten his name now, but I've, I've been been yelled at by councillors in Mackay. So there's a fight there in Rockhampton. The, the, the council itself is on side. The council administration is pushing to keep a number of books, um, including Gender Queer um, and some other highly pornographic comics. Uh, in Bundaberg, uh, they're pushing to keep Gender Queer, I think. They haven't made a decision yet on that. But there have been councils from Mackay and Townsville all the way down to Western Downs and Southern Downs that have removed books this year. And I'm very happy that those councils have taken on board um, the information they've received and decided that the book's are just not suitable for the local community. And there's some sneaky ways that some libraries try to get around this by removing the physical hard copy book from the bookshelf, but leaving it for availability as an e-book. Is that a concern? Well, look, there are. that is something that is happening. So, for instance, in Mackay, the local community there have effectively forced the council to get rid of the book Welcome to Sex, which is not one of the books I'm targeting because that's kind of classified as a educational book. I'm not saying it is educational. I think it is a disgusting book that should be removed. It actually teaches children to engage in pornography. That's child pornography. It is very bad. Um, but because it's classification of educational book, um, I've kind of left that one. But the local community in Mackay um, have effectively forced council to remove that physical book. Um, council have decided, and they said that it got too damaged, is what they decided. But they have now got the ebook. The good news about the ebook, I guess, is that children can't go to the library and just find it. Um, they have to be able to log on, you know. So there is, I guess, a distance or limitation there. Um, but it, you know, it should go all together. Families advocate Bernard Gaynor is with us, and uh, Bernie, we're about to meet someone that you've had some connection with. Uh, there's. Not just things that are going on in your backyard. Your state is Queensland. We mentioned that there's some campaigns going in Bundaberg and Mackay and Rockhampton. Uh, But there's some things going on around Australia too and people getting a little hot under the collar and not going to stand for this sort of stuff in their own communities. Yeah, for sure, Neil. And so the local action is the best way to win these fights. Uh, so not not some centralised campaign, but people poking their own councillors in the chest and saying, hey, this isn't good enough. And so I've been really, really happy to support uh, people who are, are taking action themselves in their own community, and they're achieving some great results. You know, they're achieving things that I haven't been able to achieve, uh, and I'm inspired by them, uh, and I think they're doing great work, and we should really be encouraging these little groups to form everywhere because that is how we can make our own little part of the world beautiful i guess take some of the 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 ugliness out of our community so i'm very happy to work with people like michelle kinsella from western australia who's doing a great job over in albany i'm working with others in other states as well i think they're they're doing wonderful work michelle kinsella is joining us from albany in wa hey michelle welcome along thank you very much for inviting me i appreciate it Michelle, let's get a little insight here into what's making you tick here because somehow or other uh, something welled up inside you and you said uh, we can't just let this happen to our children in my community, in Albany, in WA, uh, a battle around the sexualisation of children. Uh, Give us your insight. What's making you tick here? Yeah, sure. So um, I just want to say from the outset, it's not just me. Um, I have a fantastic colleague called Tamara Freeman and she is a real driving force and one of the main instigators here. I've worked as an advocate for a few years, generally helping parents uh, in terms of uh, education and getting access to medical care. So uh, Tamara came to me, she explained she'd had uh, gotten the sack from the school board and I became quite concerned and through that sort of situation we realised that 
the sexualization of children isn't just happening in education. And when you ask inconvenient questions, you aren't just silenced, you're sacked from school boards. But it's also happening in our local community. I had a lady give me a library book uh, called Welcome to Sex, and it was found in the junior section right next to the toddlers. So a librarian, in theory, could read this during story time to children. And I was horrified at what I saw. It is a sexually graphic book. It promotes, in my eyes, illegal activities because it is illegal to have sex under the age of 16. And I just couldn't believe that this was in our library. Now, about a year prior, I had found a book, which is another one that we are targeting in our campaign, and it's called A Sex a Book for Teens, and it's a sex guide. Now, graphic warning, within that sex guide, again in the junior section of the Albany Town Library, you can receive instructions on a violent sexual act called fisting. And there is a step-by-step guide of how to do fisting. Now, that's a violent sexual act. There is no intimacy or love involved, and it comes with a high risk of a you know, physical uh, damage. Okay, so some of the things, uh, Michelle, that people might be familiar with uh, in a hardcore pornographic environment, what we'd call an adult environment, these things are becoming uh, acceptable uh, for local libraries uh, to have on their bookshelves. Now, just double back a moment, because this came to light in WA, in your community in Albany, because there was a person, a friend of yours, no doubt, sacked from the school board. That means the school board was quite happy to have these sorts of books, and anyone speaking up against it, uh, they were rubbing us all up the wrong way and decide to uh, push her out, squeeze her out, sack her from the board. So you're talking school libraries here as well as the council library? Well, the school library, uh, didn't. we didn't find these books in the library. But what happened was that the school was starting to implement uh, certain ideologies that we felt went against the ethos of the school and was age inappropriate. And the school was actually advertising some of the pride events. And it started with just simple questions about, uh, you know, minor attracted persons, How can we protect children? Is the school the right place to be advertising, um, you know, a festival basically based on sex and sex choices? And it really came about from quite uh, an innocent point of view, and it just snowballed. But it was a catalyst for Tamara and I to get together. We got about six people in our committee, became aware of what was happening in the local library, and decided to do something about it. So what we've done here in Albany is we spoke to council on two separate occasions during the general meeting. We brought up our concerns about the sexually graphic material available. And what we've used is the Local Government Act. And we have forced the council into what's called a special meeting of electors, which will be next Monday night, the 26th of August at 6.30pm. With a special meeting of electors, electors get to go along, we get to present motions, and the topics that we are covering are the Welcome to Sex Book Guide and the Teen Sex Guide, and we're also addressing the issue of a twerk workshop that was held for all ages in our town hall uh, during the Pride Festivals. You know, twerking is a sexualized dance and not appropriate for children at all. So we're covering those three topics by by themselves. We're not going after any community groups. We're just staying on topic with the community concern. Michelle, let me bring Bernard in here for a moment because um, it's challenging hearing those things Michelle is sharing. Uh, but I know you've been saying, uh, Bernard, that, uh, that somehow or other there is like a popularisation of uh, pedophilic behaviour and these sorts of things flow into that. How does that work? I mean, if you if you just uh, put your head in the sand, don't do anything in your community, in your town, in your suburb, and these things just continue to propagate either in schools or in the local libraries, what do you think's happening? Where is this heading? Well, look, I, I think that there is a contest of ideas um, in society on all sorts of different topics, uh, and that contest will be won by the people who turn up to fight it, Okay. And there are some people who believe that children should be able to have sex um, between themselves and with adults. Uh, These people are emboldened in today's permissive world. 
Uh, they think that they are going to win. Uh, they are using flags and symbols to, I guess, cover what they want. Um, there is a culture of intimidation and silence, and they think they can get away with, you know, sexualizing children. Um, and also, I think that many people who are opposed to these ideas feel isolated and alone, and that they can no longer speak. They'll lose their jobs, for instance, um, or they're the only one left that thinks that way. But actually, when they do speak up, they find themselves able to influence culture and society and to win. Uh, I think we need to have confidence that our ideas will win because they are good ideas, not just good morally, they are good for society. Before the news, uh, let me just take this another step deeper here with you, Michelle, because from what I understand, uh, this forced meeting with the Albany Council uh, also includes the issue of condoms that were being distributed in the local library. Uh, is that the is that yeah. the, the fact? Yeah, so what we found was there was a box of condoms and associated promotional material from Condor Man um, promoting the use of lube. We actually removed the condoms from the library. We took them as evidence for our complaint. Now, the council were very good on that issue and they did agree to remove the condoms and the offending posters from the uh, library, which was fantastic. That was definitely a win for our children. But it was just one step in the process. The more that they normalise sexualization of children, the harder we have to push back. I feel we, and we have been, I must admit, overwhelmed with the support in our community. I'm talking hundreds and hundreds of people have come to us, have attended our meetings and said thank you for standing up because you've inspired us to have a voice. Bernie, is this the case? Uh, someone stands up and says, wait a minute, uh, this is not right. Uh, then others will let down whatever position they've been holding to and actually support uh, that one who's going into battle for the kids. Yeah, absolutely. So if people see one person stand up, they uh, uh, that, they, they feel empowered and confident to, to join in. And it's, you know, that, that example that Michelle put about the condoms in the library, you know, that is disgusting. And unless someone had stood up and said, this is not good enough, that'd still be there. But all it took was a little group to say, hang on, we don't like this. Uh, and probably the councillors didn't know that this was happening. The librarians may have. But as soon as you bring it to someone's attention, it becomes very embarrassing to defend. And you've got, you've got to get rid of them. Uh, Bernard, the thought that this is a campaign that is beginning to snowball, some people will be encouraged by that. But some people will feel like, you know, I don't think it'll work in my community. The people at our library don't listen to me. The councillor isn't listen to me. The school principal, the school board, they're not listening to me. But uh, when someone speaks up, that's not the case. Something can happen. Well, look, in Logan City Council, it took me about nine months to win the fight there. Um, I didn't win it completely, but it took about nine months of hard effort. But we did win. Logan City Council removed books. Uh, and I think that that is the first time in Australia, in the recent history of Australia, that a council has removed books that are pornographic, uh, or for moral reasons, I guess you could say. All it takes is some effort uh, and a little bit of logic. One of the best methods you can use is to take a photo of the imagery inside the book uh, and send it to the councillors and send it to the CEO and tell them it's not good enough. Now, after a while, they're going to get sick of having their face put next to the imagery that they want to put in libraries for kids. They don't want their face next to this stuff. They don't want to be linked with it, and they'll cave in. Okay, a simple way of alerting your counsellors. Uh, find one of those books. If, you, if they're in your library, I mean, you might have to go searching, uh, but find the book. Take your, a photo of the offensive material, send it to the counsellors, send it to the media, and uh, with some way of actually drawing attention to this. I mentioned you've got campaigns underway in Brisbane, in Mackay, in Rockhampton, in Bundaberg. Uh, Michelle Kinsella is on the line with us as well. Michelle, you're in Albany in WA, but there are some other communities that are also beginning these campaigns too. Uh, give us your insight here into those other communities that are concerned about children and protecting them in their communities. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that. If I can just touch on what uh, Bernard said uh, to start with, this is exactly what we did. We made a flyer from the contents from Welcome to Sex and I just want to also add, Welcome to Sex, one of the authors, her name on 
Twitter is actually called Yummy Child. Okay? We took photos and we made a flyer. Facebook actually removed the flyer because it went against uh, community standards on sexuality and nudity. And we attempted to give the flyer to the council. Now, we were blocked by the mayor and a gag order was placed on the councillors. So what we did is when we attended one of the meetings, we personally handed out the flyer to every single councillor and asked them, is this okay? That was really impactful because once you've seen the images, you can't unsee them, unfortunately. Um, and that's why we want to protect children. But we have councils, uh, Joondalup, Melville and Bustleton. So far, there are groups in those uh, council areas that want to replicate what we have been doing. And there are a few more that have asked not to be mentioned at this stage because they're trying to work within the council uh, to have success before they go public. Okay, so working quietly before uh, exposing these images to councillors and demanding some meetings uh, with councillors and even at council meetings, um, working quietly, is that a good way to start, Bernie? Uh, is that a... Or you just go public at the beginning? What What are your thoughts? Well, my preference would be to know who the councillors are and then you can work with those councillors who are on side. You don't, you don't want to get councillors who are on side, off side by embarrassing them unintentionally. Mm. 100%, yeah. if you can work with them, do it. But quite often um, I found that it's hard to work out who the councillors are until you start the campaign because they're not willing to put themselves, I guess, out one way or the other. Um, so if you can work quietly with the councillors you know, go for it. If you don't know who they are, have the courage anyway because – You'll shake the tree and find out where people fall. Now, our talkback line is open on 1-800-316-316. And uh, Bernie says, you know, if you're wondering if these books are in your local library, uh, you can name your town and uh, Bernie will give you his insight where he's at uh, with whether those books are available or whether he does not know. So 1-800-316-316 to join in the conversation there. Michelle, you're taking things even deeper as well because you're planning to have some online Zoom meetings so that you can help train people in their community. If you discover these books in your local council library or in school libraries, uh, you're training people as to what they should do next. What are you planning with those Zoom sessions? Yeah, absolutely. So in WA, we're lucky we've got our own WA classification laws, which can be used. And we've also got the Local Government Act. Um, I'm a great believer in democracy. And I feel that people need to stand up and voice what they want. And they want to stop the sexualization of children. So during the Zoom sessions, we're going to talk about what we feel has worked, what hasn't worked, uh, using uh, the law to present uh, community concerns to the council. We're very lucky. We've actually had a very good response from a number of councillors here that agree with us wholeheartedly. Now, a few months ago, one of our council members spoke at council about what does the plus mean in the LGBTQIA plus. Now, he was vilified by the local media and the ABC, which spread misinformation. Now, the media are a little bit cautious because we've actually gone to the media as well. I was knocking on their locked door the other day, um, asking to talk to them and asking why they keep spreading misinformation. And I think once you use your voice, when you come from a place of truth and honour and, of course, having faith in the Lord, people actually tend to listen. And we do it in a nice way, just by opening the conversation. So I do want to say we have had some council members here in Albany that are very, very supportive. And I feel very positive that we're actually going to win this war to protect our children in our community. I'm glad you've mentioned your faith and uh, as Bernard is sitting here in the studio with me and uh, I know that uh, Bernard will be able to say people of faith have some substance to what makes them stand up on the inside and then stand up on the outside. Whether you are Catholic or Protestant, uh, you'll hold these values. These are biblical values that a parent would protect their children from these sorts of insidious uh, dangers. Uh, there is a sense here, and I know, Bernard, we've spoken about this before, you're driven by your faith in your understanding, and uh, we're hearing this from Michelle as well. People of faith, uh, sometimes reluctant to stand up, but this is a time for people of faith to actually let their colours be known. 
Oh, absolutely. So mm -hmm. everything I do is driven, I think, by my Catholic faith, um, and I hope I do it with a good intention for God. Uh, I think Christians generally have a good moral understanding of the the sanctity of marriage. Um, you know, but this this is an issue that goes broader than Christianity. There are, there are a lot of people in Australia who don't have a religious belief um, or maybe a, an alternative belief religious belief, but who understands, I guess, at least the consequences um, for poor moral decisions in relation to sexuality. And I guess this is what really drives me politically is I want people to be happy. So we've seen new stories over the last couple of years of, of people who've had, I guess, encounters, sexual encounters. They've just left them miserable and their court cases here and court cases there and, and this and that. Um, you know, that, that's at one extreme, but if you just look after your children and you, you think, you know, if they have a relationship that goes bad um, and it's outside of marriage, they're going to end up miserable um, and agitated and unhappy, and you want to try and prevent that. And at the same time, my wife and I have had 21 years of very, very happy marriage, and I would love other people to be able to experience the joy in that. And so I guess this is not some prudish campaign, you know, tut-tutting at other people. This is about setting up a society where our children can flourish. Because the type of books that are being promoted in these libraries actually lead to great unhappiness and misery. And that is what I think politically is driving me. I want people to be happy and to live in a wonderful world. You know, as you describe that, uh, there are those in the community who may not name themselves as being religious in any way. But uh, in some sense, we could describe those people as cultural Christians because they have come to expect and to enjoy what Christianity has won for them uh, in the Christian foundations of our nation. So this sort of cultural Christianity, and there will be a lot of people in communities who recognize these values, this morality as being Christian, uh, but they perhaps are not yet even religious themselves. Hey, 1-800-316-316 to join in our conversation. Let me ask you about money. Um, is, there a, is there a fighting fund that you're building, Michelle, in WA? Do you know, we have actually been blessed by some people in the community that have given us financial assistance because this also takes a lot of time and energy. For example, this week, I'm not working. I'll be preparing our motions for the presentation next week. Uh, anybody who does want to offer any sort of assistance can contact us via the Facebook page, Keeping Children Safe 2024, and send a message. We haven't as yet because we have been warned actually about fundraising and to make sure that we've got all the legalities in place. So we're being cautious because we don't want anything to interrupt what we're doing. Now, the other thing I really would love to take the opportunity to mention is I've been fighting various battles over the years. It has always been women that are standing up. And what has absolutely shocked us to the core, and it is fantastic, is we are seeing men. We are seeing men stand up to protect their daughters and their sons, to protect their families. Public meeting we held, we had 25 RSVPs. 115 people turned up and 75% of the audience was men. Okay. And that was wonderful to see. That was very inspiring. Okay. Men standing up for morality and fatherhood in a community which is very powerful taking calls 1-800-316-316 let's hear from chris in orange in new south wales hey chris welcome thank you neil yes i was just listening to you with interest we we've had this situation here in orange uh, in fact this time last year with the uh, purple day we were inundated with flyers of the betty confetti drag queen reading uh, books to children in the library and um, about five of us got together, um, gathered the community, and uh, we complained to the council. We sent them uh, images. In fact, that book, Gender Queer, was one of those books. Well, and the Chris, uh, let me just bring uh, Bernard Gaynor into this. Um, Bernie, you might have some thoughts specifically for Chris. 
And, uh, of course, uh, the way that one thing leads to another. And uh, libraries, I mean, this is just another example, isn't it? Uh, the way the drag queen story time has taken off in so many libraries. Uh, one thing leads to another and things begin to get beyond your control and normalisation sets in. But what are your thoughts here for Chris? Well, look, uh, Chris, first of all, I'm going to say well done and congratulations on taking effort. And Genderqueer definitely is in the Orange Library catalogue. None of the other books I'm targeting are there, so that's good news. Um, but I think Chris is an example of what's going on in Australia, but in an unorganised way. There are lots of little community groups taking action. And I guess part of what I'm doing and working with Michelle and Angela Rojas in South Australia and others is trying to build more of, I guess, an organised national campaign that can empower mm. local communities. Because, Chris, I'd love to be in contact with you. Please contact me through my website. Um, there are these little groups everywhere taking action, and I think that if we were more organised, we would have far greater impact. But I think it's wonderful what you're doing. Uh, a thought or two, Michelle, we've still got you on the line. Yeah. Uh, Michelle, what are your thoughts when you hear Chris and uh, her actions in Orange? Oh, I can't just help but smile. Well done you, Chris, because it only takes a couple of people and the army starts to build. It literally took two of us in Albany and we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people behind us. So well done you, Chris, for taking the initiative, being brave and standing up for our children. I love hearing these stories. Thank you, Michelle. I must say we did have some success. Uh, one of the councillors moved a motion to have the decision-making process taken away from the libraries for these sorts of things. So now and the librarians I can't just go ahead and do it. So this year we have no drag queen story time well now, done the books have been moved i mean they were the tables were covered with these books with shadow yeah. frogs to attract the kids uh, chris you and michelle that? just just cut in here uh, bernard um is this a a real this sounds to me like a very powerful thing that can happen uh taking away the uh, the final stamp of approval from the librarian, um, that's going to be controversial, no doubt. But what are your thoughts here? Uh, I say 100%. This is where it needs to go. So the librarian class in general is going to tell people they can't do anything about the books. These are the books we've got. Our hands are tied by policy. That is rubbish. The councillors are the, I guess, the board of directors. They're, every council has unfettered discretion to choose the books that meet the needs of the local community. Provided those books aren't illegal, they can put whatever they want on the shelves, which means they can also take whatever they want off the shelves. So the librarians actually need to be put back in their box and told that their job is to meet the needs of the community and the board of directors, which are the councillors, need to turn around and say, we're taking control of this because you guys are actually running an agenda that is harmful to our community. So well done, I say. That is that is 100% the way to go. Well, sometimes the councillors don't know these books are there. One of the councillors threatened to call the police when I sent him images of one of the books. So it's important that the councillors are informed. Chris, thank you so much for your insight. Uh, outstanding and uh, the encouragement there. Uh, connect with Bernie and there may be opportunity for you to be networking uh, in the good work that you're doing around the nation. Chris, thank you so much for your call. Uh, let me come back here a moment uh, to uh, classifications on these things because there must be some sort of uh, controversies around uh, censorship and the classification review boards I mean, unless there's some sort of reform that happens in classification, these things are going to continue, aren't they? Uh, Bernie, your thoughts for uh, for that particular issue around classification review boards? Yeah, so in very briefly, so people understand, the Commonwealth is responsible for classifying the books, so giving them a rating or movies. The states are then responsible for working out how to deal with those things. So if a Commonwealth book, so the Commonwealth classifies a book like The Boys Restricted, in Queensland you cannot sell it. In New South Wales, it can only be sold in an over-18s venue. So each state has their own laws in relation to that. And then local councils with their libraries, I guess, provide content to the community. Um, they are rubbing... Sometimes they're, they're trying to wash their hands of this and saying it's up to the classification board to decide what we can put on the shelves. That is not true. Classification board just gives the book a rating. Councils decide what goes on the shelves. Now, there does need to be reform, and there is currently a, a process underway to do that um, which provides an opportunity. But people need to understand the biggest problem, I think, is not so much the law, it's the people doing the classification. So last year with Gender Queer, 
The author of that book herself says it is indisputable that she has drawn a minor being touched on the genitalia. The classification board and classification review board, um, who is led by an LGBTQI advocate, did not want to deal with that. So they simply decided that that boy was a consenting adult. Now, I'm understanding that some people can be very cynical about this and say that these people are pushing an agenda. I'm going to be charitable. I'm going to say that it is... I accept that the classification review board and the board itself honestly thought that the child was an adult. And you know what that means? It means these people are incompetent and they should be sacked because they are protected to protect children. That's their job. And if they cannot look at a picture of pedophilia and identify the child, they are unsuitable to be in the classification system. It is a disgrace we have people who cannot tell what a child is in the classification system. They should be sacked and the minister should take action and sack them. And might be another example of a slippery slope because these issues around classification uh, date right back to a case back in 1968 when things began to really deteriorate. 1968, that sounds like a long time ago, doesn't it? Uh, But over all these years, uh, things have deteriorated. It used to be that there was censorship, and censorship was a little bit too hard black and white for some. Uh, Classification came in back in 1968, and uh, this classification process has just decided to move the letters on classification on various things according to community sentiments. Uh, So uh, there's a challenge there for getting behind any sort of uh, campaign that might be about how you reform the classification review boards here in Australia. Uh, We have run out of time. I do want to ask you, Bernard Gaynor, um, you've got a a bit of a a war chest uh, potentially developing here. I know there's challenges around all sorts of things. Uh, You're no stranger to being dragged before tribunals and courts, and that's ongoing for you. We haven't talked about that in any detail at all uh, in this conversation. You are no stranger to uh, putting your head above the parapet and uh, getting shot down uh, time and time again. Is there a way that listeners, I mean, some listeners may already be supporters of yours, but uh, what's a way that people can get behind the good campaigns you're running? Sure. Well, thank you so much for this, Neil. And I think Michelle mentioned earlier that these battles are time consuming. I think we need to understand that unless we take a professional approach and have people working full time on these battles, uh, we're just not going to win. The other side work on these things full time. So I've been very grateful for the support I've received that enables me to work full time on these fights. And I do have ongoing litigation against me, which we haven't even spoken about. I was in court last week. But what I want to bring to the listeners attention today is that I'm in the process of going to the Federal Court of Australia to challenge the classification on genderqueer. Um, and this is an important battle because, you know, if, if we don't fight this, pedophilia imagery will be legalised in Australia. It will become culturally acceptable. Um, so if people would like to donate, please go to my website, bernardgaynor.com.au, um, and donate uh, at the donate link there um, because it is very expensive to fight these battles. Um, but, yes, yeah, so I'm headed to the federal court ladder on this year on that particular classification issue. So if any support will be gratefully accepted. Okay, so we've got to draw things to a close. Uh, Let me just reiterate how you can be supportive of these two guests that we've had on with us this hour uh, to support Bernard Gaynor, to connect with him, to be able to access whatever resources he's able to offer, uh, to get onto his mailing list and get an update on things as they're happening, bernardgaynor.com.au, bernardgaynor.com.au. And beyond this conversation today, you might even want to just send Bernie a note saying, are these books in my local library? And he will be able to tell you, according to his research, whether they are or not, bernardgaynor.com.au. And uh, Michelle Kinsella has been our other guest. Michelle, you can connect with her on Facebook, and especially for those listeners in Western Australia, uh, given there's some expansion of what's happening and uh, there are some ways in which they're getting on their feet so far as these campaigns, connect with Michelle on spa- on Facebook, Keeping Children Safe 2024. And keeping in mind also for those listeners in Albany, and there's lots of listeners in Albany, uh, that on the 26th of August, 6.30pm at Albany Chambers on North Road, there is that address to the council there. Uh, So, Michelle, I want to say thank you so much for taking part in our conversation today. Thank you. Could I just add as well, 
We have actually taken this to the state government's level uh, to look at these classification laws state-wide. And we've got two fantastic members of parliament that are supporting us. And we also have an e-petition that is on the WA government website. And it is very important that people sign that e-petition so the members of parliament can table it and we can have a committee and an investigation into the classification laws in WA and how, ask the questions, how did these sexually graphic books end up on library shelves uh, to be exposed to children. So um, the support and even today's, uh, the radio, it's absolutely fantastic. And thank you very much for giving us this platform to spread awareness. Well, Michelle, thank you so much. And uh, keep up the great work defending children in Western Australia. That Facebook address, Keeping Children Safe 2024, to connect with Michelle Kinsella, K-I-N-S-E-L-L-A, and bernardgaynor.com.au to connect with Bernie. Bernie, thank you so much for taking time to share these thoughts in an update with listeners today on 2020. Not a problem, Neil. Thank you very much for having me on the show as well. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.